in this video we are basically going to be looking at transfer of title and then also we'll be looking at the dogma of Nemo that quote and habit and we'll also be sharing with you the general rule governing that the statutory provisions and also case law but very interestingly we'll also be sharing exceptions to the maxim of Nemo that quote and habit we'll be sharing both the exceptions under statute and also under common law and also as a bonus i'll be sharing with you the effect of theft or fraud on title of an owner of converted uh, goods hello there my name is mutiaba conrad i am a lawyer and a private law tutor and before we start on our class i encourage you to ensure that you have subscribed to my channel this is really very important to you so that every time videos are released this is always brought to your attention to ensure that you really don't miss out on these very important classes. And then also ensure that you share this video with your friends. Please ensure you share with them so they are also able to benefit this knowledge just as you're also finding it helpful. And then in case you like, you like our video, just give it a thumbs up. And finally, students interested in private law tutorial sessions, please feel free to reach out to us. Our numbers are down in the description box please call us, WhatsApp us, we'll be able to help you improve your grades, good grades really matter, and students who have been on our private law tutorial sessions have been proven to outperform their colleagues who do not have any sort of mentorship or help. So please contact the experts, our numbers are down in the description box. So let's jump right into our subject, Nemo that quote, non habit, which is a legal dogma, which basically means that a person cannot pass title that they actually do not have. So let's proceed and state the general rule basically which uh, governs transfer of title and the general rule relating to transfer of title is that a seller cannot transfer to the buyer of goods a better title than he or herself actually has. Now please note that the general rule can actually be found under section 29 of the sale of goods and supply of services act which actually provides for that general rule now this general rule what is important to note is that if the seller's title is defective then the buyer's title of course will also be subject to the same defect and this maxim has commonly been uh, abbreviated under the latin terminology or term which basically means nemo dat quote non habit which in summary really means that no one can give what they do not have so if you don't own something you cannot purport to sell it or give it away because from the very beginning you do not have any sort of ownership to such property or goods so basically that dogma is what summarizes the general rule under section 29 of the sale of goods and supply of services act now having laid down the general rule and we have also discussed what the rule uh, or the maxim nemo that quote non habit actually means it is now very important for us to actually look at the locus classicus case or the main case that actually has um, uh, given out or laid down this general rule as stated please i encourage you to look at the case of bishops gate motor fiance corporation versus transport bricks limited it's a case of 1949 uh, volume 1, King's Bench, page 332. And basically in that case, Lord Denning, as he then was, basically um, gave a very interesting principle where he stated that two principles have striven uh, for mastery. And basically the first principle is that no one can give a better title than they have. That's the first principle that Lord Denning actually established in that, that case. And it's that principle that is relevant to our general rule, which I earlier discussed. But then also in earlier, the second principle that actually Lord Denning ironed out is that a person who takes in good faith and for value without notice should get a good title. Now we'll be looking at the applicability of this second principle later on when we are looking at the maxims. Uh, or the exceptions of the name of that quote non habit but at this stage it's important for you to know that those two principles Lord Denning in that case of Bishop's Gate Motor Fiance Corporation versus Transport Breaks Limited were really established very very strongly by Lord Denning now having laid out the, the foundation we now know 
the general rule. Uh, we now know the statutory provision, which is Section 29 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act. We also know what the Maxim Nemodat Court Nan Habit actually stands for, and it stands for the general rule. I have also shared with you a case to illustrate these two very interesting principles, but for the general rule, of course, it's a first principle in that case of Bishop's Gates that applies. It's now very important to understand how really does this general rule work and what exactly does it state? Now, in summary here, what the general rule means is that in case someone uh, buys goods or if someone purports to sell goods to another person, if that person does not have a good title or if that person does not have ownership of those goods, they cannot then purport to sell them to another party. And this is just logical. If you do not own, let's say, uh, a phone, but then you purport to sell it to another person when you know it's not yours, you don't have authority to sell it, and you also don't have the consent of the owner to sell it, you cannot say that you have passed on ownership to the buyer because in the first place you did not have any ownership. So this is what the general rule actually provides in summary. And this is really very important because in day life, this happens every single day. We find ourselves in situations where uh, you find that, for example, you have lost your phone or your laptop, maybe by fraud or by theft. And now the thief is purporting to sell your phone or laptop to another party. Okay, so here we are saying that in such situations, the thief who has stolen your phone cannot pass title to a person who they sell that phone to or laptop or whatever you have lost that the thief is now selling to another party. Why? Because in the first place, they did not have title to these goods. They didn't own them. So they cannot then purport to be selling them to another party. This is what the rule is basically saying. And the rule is saying that you, the owner, from whom the goods were stolen at all material times, you will always have ownership and title of those goods that the thief is purporting to sell or pass on to the buyer. That's what the general rule in summary, ladies and gentlemen, is about. Now, having explained it, laid down the statutory and case law provisions, let's now proceed to look at the exceptions to the rule in Nemo that quote non habit or to that dogma or maxim. And this is really very important to know the exceptions because the general rule is not in itself self-conclusive. There are certain exceptions. What do we mean here? What we mean is that there are some circumstances that the law recognizes that actually there will be an effective transfer of title, okay, where the seller is actually not the one who has the ownership of the goods. So let's now proceed to look at the exceptions. And please, I encourage you uh, for the general exceptions to look um, at section from section 29 to section 33 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act. It actually provides for the statutory exceptions. And then we'll also be looking at the other exceptions under a common law in material detail. So the first exception, ladies and gentlemen, that we're gonna be looking at in this class is what we call an uh, un unauthorized sale by a mercantile agent. So if a mercantile agent carries out an unauthorized sale, okay, then such sale, there would have been transfer of property. Now it's important here to note that this is an agent. Okay, please note, this is an agent and he's a mercantile agent. He's a business agent to a principal and he is selling goods, although not with the express uh, authority of the principal, but they are doing this because it's in their due course. It's what they are acting as an agent, okay, of the principal. Please, I encourage you to look at section 29, subsection 1 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act. It actually provides... Uh, for the exception. Now, it's important to note that section 29 provides for one, the general rule, which I have earlier discussed with you in material detail, but it's also very important to note that it actually provides in within an exception where it states that unless the owner of the goods is by his or her conduct precluded from denying the seller's authority to sell. Okay, now that is an exception. And that is the exception that we are looking at here. 
And that exception has been uh, recognized in a number of cases, but quite very interestingly, I encourage you to look at the judgment of Lesit J in the case of Symbion East Africa Printers Limited versus Kase Mbugua and another. This is civil suit number 614 of 2008. It's a Kenyan decision, quite interesting. Please try and find it and read it in detail. But there, basically, Justice Lesit J recognized that exception under section 29, subsection 1 of the Sale of Goods and Supply Services Act of Uganda. But of course, here he was looking at the same act under uh, Kenyan law, which is quite similar to the Ugandan position as well. So basically, an unauthorized sale by a mercantile agent, if that happens, there will be an effective transfer of title. But just very briefly, what you should know is that as a rule, a mercantile agent having authority to sell goods can convey a good title to the buyer, even though he sold the goods without having the authority of the principal. Now, if the following conditions are fulfilled or satisfied, then that is when definitely uh, such title will pass by the mercantile agent. So let's look at some of these exceptions for that first um, uh, exception to operate. The following three have to be in place. Number one is that the agent should have been in possession of the goods or documents of title to the goods. That is the first qualifier for that first exception. And then the second is that the agent should have sold the goods while acting in his ordinary course of agency business. So the seller must have acted as an agent for the principal, less of which the first exception would not apply. And then lastly, the buyer should have acted in good faith without having had any notice at the time of the contract that the agent has no authority to sell. So again, you remember the second principle that, uh, that Lord Denning brought in in the other first case that I shared with you. Now again, we are seeing it here coming into play and it's very important to note. So let's now proceed and we look at the second exception. And basically the second exception is a sale by a joint owner. Now, if there is a joint owner, remember under uh, your principles of land law, uh, basically two persons can own property jointly. It can either be two or three. Now, in case persons own property jointly and there is a sale by one of the joint owners, then our property would have effectively passed to the buyer of such goods or services or products. Now, what is important here to note is that where one of the several joint owners of goods has the sole possession of them. So it's one person having the sole possession by permission of the other co-owners. The other co-owners allow them to possess these goods and the property in the goods is transferred to another person who buys them from such joint, joint owner in good faith and again without notice of the fact that the seller has no authority to sell then that buyer acquires a good title and there is effective transfer of property to them and ownership. Now let's proceed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to look at the third exception. And the third exception is what we call sell by a seller in possession after a sale. Now here there is a seller, okay, who is, who is in possession. Okay, of certain goods and after carrying out a sale, but they proceed to sell the same goods to another party. Please, I encourage you to look at section 32, subsection 1 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act. It is very authoritative on this, but basically just to throw more light where a seller, uh, after having sold the goods to a buyer, continues to be in possession of such goods or of the documents of title to those same goods and again resells or maybe pledges them either himself or through a mercantile agent, he will definitely convey a good title to the buyer or the pledge or the pledge provided that the buyer or the pledge or the pledge rather acts in good faith and without notice of the previous sale. So this is really very important. And again, uh, besides the first statutory uh, authority, which I shared with you under section 32, subsection one of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act, I also encourage you to look at the case of Bishop's Gate versus Transport Gates Limited, which I earlier shared with you in material detail. Especially please interest yourself 
in the second principle, it's really of paramount importance. So let's now proceed to look at the next exception. And basically, the next exception is what we call transfer of title by estopel. Please, you have to first understand what estopel actually means. Now, estopel means that a person who, by his or her words, uh, leads another to believe that a certain state of affairs existed, he would be stopped from denying later on, on such a state of affairs. They will be denied to actually say that such a state of affairs, in fact, exist so basically estopel it operates in a way that if you tell someone okay uh, to rely on certain facts or if you assure them that you'll act in a certain way if you later on turn around and say that you'll not act in such a way then you'd be stopped okay from going against your initial word or your initial actions or your initial promise that's how basically the rule of estopel applies it basically prevents someone from going against their initial promise or words provided that they express themselves in such a way now how does this a doctrine or principle of estopel work it works in such a way for example under the sale of goods and supply of services act estopel may arise in any of the following ways okay number one where the owner, okay, standing by when the sale is effected. So there is a sale going on and the owner is standing around, watching, listening, observing everything that is going on. Later on, if they purport not to have given consent or been part of the transaction, they would be stopped and court will find that actually property passed because the owner was around. They would be stopped from denying the fact that they knew everything about the transaction. Secondly, the owner assisting in the sale so if a sale is going on and the owner is assisting he or she will be stopped from denying that actually the buyer has acquired title to the same the other third scenario is the owner permitting the goods to go into the possession of another with the intent that the other party shall have such possession and title thereof that's another scenario where under the sale of goods and supply of services act estopel may arise and then lastly if he has otherwise acted or made representation so as to induce the buyer to alter his position to his prejudice then in such a circumstance as well under sale of goods the principle of uh, estopel will come in to stop them from denying such acts or actions and court definitely will find that property had moved and actually the seller even though under quotations or purportedly uh, they may not have uh, the authority to sell but court will find that actually they did because uh, the owner was in presence or if any of those situations that i've shared with you have or are in presence please i encourage you to look at the case of corner versus clark it is a case of 1895 170 pa 318 uh, 300 and two a this case is very authoritative and it basically illustrates uh, the principle of estopel and how court will apply it to ensure that it prevents a party from denying their previous actions as to the transfer of title to a buyer and basically in corner versus clark the brief facts of the case are that m the owner of a wagon allowed one of his employees call them k to have his name printed on the wagon now m did so for the purpose of inducing the public to believe that actually the wagon belonged to K or it was owned by K. Now, C purchased the wagon from K in good faith. Okay, for them, they purchased in good faith. They didn't know. Okay, and C acquired a good title and M was stopped by court from denying K's authority to sell. Why? because one party acted in a way to make them believe that actually the other one was the owner of the wagon whereas not therefore they were they were stopped from denying a sale that had occurred so court applied the doctrine of estopel to deny them from denying um, uh, such a sale as to its validity and court went on to hold that actually title had effectively been transferred and passed to 
the buyer of such goods. So let's now proceed, ladies and gentlemen, to look at another exception, and this is sale by the buyer in possession after agreement to buy. This is the other exception which we are proceeding to look at. And basically where a buyer has agreed to buy the goods and has obtained possession, okay, of the same or the documents of title to them with the consent of the seller and he resells or pledges the goods, he will convey a good title to the buyer or the pledgee provided the latter acts in good faith without notice of any other right of the original seller in respect of the goods. Again, please, I encourage you to go and uh, look at the case of Bishop's Gate versus Transport Gates Limited. I encourage you to look at the second principle that was espoused by uh, Lord Denning. Basically, it operates in a sense to say that if someone acts in good faith without notice of any other third party interests and they uh, buy goods, the, the principle under common law is that the law will recognize their interest and title to have uh, been uh, passed to that party. So it's really very important to look at that case, look at the second principle, and always know how it applies in such situations where someone buys goods in good faith without notice uh, of any other rights. Now, what is important to note is that under this exception, the person must have obtained possession of the goods under an agreement to sell. Okay, this is really very important because where one has merely an option to buy, okay, for example, in a higher purchase transaction, then definitely he can never pass a good title to another buyer. Now, let's now proceed and look at um, another exception, and this is sale under avoidable title. Please look at section 30 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act. It actually provides for this exception. But what is important for you to know is that when a seller of goods has avoidable title to such goods, but his title has not been avoided at the time of the sale, then the position of the law is that the buyer acquires a good title provided he buys them in good faith, that is the goods, without notice of the seller's defect of title. This is very, very important to note. And please, I encourage you to visit uh, some of the cases under contract law. They are very elaborate. Uh, they are very elaborative on this aspect. Please interest yourself in the case of Phillips versus Brooks Limited, 1919. We looked at this case on this channel when we are looking at contract law. We explored it in material detail, and again, it come. It is coming back here. Um, and basically, the brief facts of this case were that a fraudulent person by the name of North entered the plaintiff's shop and selected a diamond ring. Now, North paid for the ring by check by falsely representing himself to be a well-known lord in that town, where upon the plaintiff, of course, went on and allowed him to take the ring. North continued to pledge or North pledged the ring with Brooks. And of course, the check was dishonored later and the plaintiff sued the defendant for the recovery of the ring. Now, court held that there had been no mistake as to identity, but basically what court was trying to say is that the plaintiff intended to deal with the person in the shop and the property in the goods had rightly passed to the purchaser. Uh, so this is how basically court resolved this issue. Let's now proceed to look at the other exception, which is the second last exception of the Nemo Dat Quot Non Habit Doctrine, which basically says sell in a market overt. So this is the other exception, really. Sell in a market overt will always pass a good title to the purchaser. Now, what do we mean by a market overt? Now, where your goods are sold in a market overt, a buyer acquires a good title to such goods provided, please note, provided he buys them in good faith and without, and without any notice of defect in the goods. Now, the only exception is where the goods were stolen and the thief has been convicted or where the owner of the goods reported to the police after the theft of the goods. But let's first understand what is a market overt. A market overt is basically uh, the usual markets especially those markets in the streets or the general markets that we normally have. If such a market is established by law, it is supposed to be there 
and it's a market where people go to buy ordinarily their goods. Such a market overt, um, we don't expect that goods in such a market are stolen. We expect that the people who are selling such goods in such a market are the owner. And it's really very important to protect a business because if people are going in the market buying goods, but then you later on say that they don't own those goods, then you would not be securing um, what we call transactions. So that's why it's very important that when people buy goods in a market, they are confident that they are buying them from people who own them and that when they buy them, they get good title to such goods. So provided such a market is established by law, it is recognized and it is a usual continuous market known by people where goods are sold. If you go there and you buy goods, even if such goods are stolen, you acquire a good title. And this is the exception to the name of that court non habit. Uh, let's now proceed to look at the last exception to this uh, general rule, and that is sale by an order of court. So where a court basically sells certain goods or products by virtue of its order, please note that court has authority to carry out a sale, especially where judgment has been given. Such a sale by court will transfer good title to the buyer of such goods. Very, very important to note. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, those are the exceptions to the dogma of Nemodat, quote, non-habit. But before we actually end our class, I promise to give you a bonus, and that was to look at, in summary, the effect of theft or fraud on title of an owner of converted goods. So it's very important for us, and I encourage you to look at Section 31 of the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act of 2017. It provides for the effect, okay, of theft or fraud on title of an owner of converted goods. Now here, basically, what we are looking at is uh, a situation where someone has stolen goods, okay, from an owner, and then the goods have changed hands and have been converted. So we are going to look at the effect of that. And basically under section 31 subsection 1, it provides that where goods have been stolen and the offender is prosecuted under the courts of law to a conviction, the property in the stolen goods reverts to the person who was the owner of the goods. So every time there is theft, the offender is convicted, tried and convicted by court, the property in the goods will always transfer back or it will revert to the original owner. That's the effect of theft. Okay? Very important to note. But what is the effect of fraud? What if goods have been taken as a result of fraud? Now, the position of the law here is that where there is fraud, property doesn't revert, okay, to the owner of the goods by reason only. Here, the, the, the catch word is by reason only of conviction of the offender. That is not enough. By just that reason, the property does not convert. And of course, that is where in circumstances where there is fraud. But of course, as we have seen, uh, where there is theft, then property will automatically uh, revert. Please proceed and look at section 31, subsection 1, and subsection 2 for the effect. And it's always very important for a student or a researcher to always lay down the effect. So if a question comes on this topic, please proceed to, pro to give the general rule, uh, then proceed to discuss the exceptions as I've shared them with you, and then also inform the examiner, or if it's a paper that you're writing, please always ensure that you include in the effect, because we are always interested to know if the student uh, is in the know of the effect of theft or fraud on title of an owner of uh, converted goods. This would really be very important for us to know whether the student really is in the know of this. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, that is what I had to share with you. Uh, please do not forget, in case you found this video uh, helpful to you, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. It's really important to share this knowledge so that your colleagues are also able to benefit. Otherwise, if I was also mean with my knowledge, then it definitely you would never have benefited. So share this video with your colleagues, with your classmates, so they are also able to learn, so that we are able uh, to bring knowledge to this world and because you know knowledge is light this would really be important and would help our society and our community and of course finally student interested in our private law tutorial sessions our numbers are down in the description box of this video 
please contact us. Call us. We'll be able to help you in case you're struggling in law school. Feel free to contact us at any material time. So thank you very much for being part of this long journey up to the end of this video. We meet in another class. Bye-bye. Uh,